Jillian. Hi. How are, How you? are you? Oh, pretty good. I'm doing good. <laughs> um, I uh, I have Nick. Can you say hi, hi Nick. everyone? Okay, you want to go. We're going to go soon, buddy. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're streaming this live on all kinds of different places, including my uh, law firm, group page and the reason why I'm I'm doing this on our law firm group uh, page as well is because I think this is super valuable for a bunch of different people um, not just those people who are in our last life ever group so I uh, I'm super excited about today's interview we pre-recorded it Jeff why don't you tell everybody why we pre-recorded uh, sure. So um, our guest today is Dr. Ian Pearson. Ian is um, British uh, and he lives in England. And, and right now in England, it is midnight. So while Dr. Pearson might be watching this, he's very tired. So he said to me he would be happy to come on the show, but he didn't want to do it at midnight. And we thought that was a pretty reasonable request. And so we recorded this actually last week. And so I'm excited though because it's um it's a really interesting show. He talks about he's a futurologist, which is a person who uses technology and technology trends to predict the future. And he talks about how to think about the future and what's coming. Um, he gets into a couple of things that are a little bit on the uh, science fiction side, but most of it's very practical advice about how you can um, prepare yourself for next year and 10 years from now. Uh, so I'm really excited about it. And uh, I don't know, Jillian, do you have anything else? I see your um, kids there. So say bye. bye bye don't don't leave the streamcast nick's just leaving so yeah, nick's we're leaving. Leaving. Yeah, we're, <laughs> yeah so yeah you guys can keep watching but anyway so listen without any further ado what do you say we start this thing jillian let's do it all right well we'll be back at the end for just a minute to say bye i think but otherwise you won't see us for a minute well you will. It just will be the past version of ourselves, which is kind of ironic, given that we've got a futurologist on. So here it goes. Nothing. Man, I just love that intro. Every time I watch it, I'm like, it's amazing. So thank you for making that for us. Oh, thank Derek. He's the musician oh. and Zoe who's singing it. So fair enough. Fair enough. Well, if all three of you. Them, yeah. If you want to check them out, they're at Billy and the Rebels on Facebook and Instagram and Spotify thank too, you. actually. I follow them. Spotify, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> all those awesome places. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I love that intro too. So how are you doing, Jeff? Oh, I'm very, very well. Um, mm -hmm. so today is um what day is it? Monday? I don't remember. Yeah, Anyhow, Monday. It's all blurring together. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know, it's Monday sometime in June. That's what we're going with right now. Um <laughs> So, so hopefully by the time we actually uh, put this out, because unlike most of our episodes, we're not broadcasting this one live. Hopefully by the time we put this out, um, we'll uh, have a little bit more uh, freedom and we'll be, uh, we'll be out and about, right? So it's Memorial yeah. Day today. Do you have any big Memorial Day plans? No, I do not. Uh, my plans include this and another last life ever broadcast the one that's already have gone live no, by the time we uh, we're in the future we're in the by future. time we're by time so you see wild. this oh yeah by time you see this hopefully you'll have already watched that one because it's coming out on memorial day as opposed to this one which is coming out in june right right and so and and, that, and this is also ironic that we're in the future 
and we're going to be speaking to a futurist today. Uh, actually, I think that Dr. Pearson perverse the term futurologist. Future. Oh, it's more precise. Okay. Well, I'm so gonna ask him you're going to have to ask him about that. I think he'll, uh, but anyway, I'm very excited because uh, Dr. Ian Pearson, who is, I've been a huge fan of his for a long time. Um, I follow him on Twitter. We've had a lot of um, back and forth on Twitter about various concepts is one of the most accurate futurologists that there is out there. So we can talk to him about all sorts of things about what's coming up in the future, how to think about the future, all that kind of stuff. So uh, that is why I'm excited. Jillian, on the other hand, never thinks about the future. She lives in the past. So she's not excited about the show. What? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just trying to throw you off your game a little bit by saying things yeah. that are obviously not true. Yeah, I'm living in the past. Remember that time when I was seven and that stuff happened? I just never gotten over it. Every time I talk to you, all you want to do is tell me about when you graduated from high school in San Juan. <laughs> Every time. It's all about <laughs> San Juan and high school graduation and how great it was. I, I barely, the, the best thing about my high school graduation was that two of my friends from my other high school in Maine were there. And that's all I really remember. Oh, I, you know, actually, one of your friends told me that. Oh, that's how you know, because I was like, I don't ever remember talking. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, you actually have never mentioned your high school graduation, but, but this <laughs> other friend of yours, a mutual friend of ours, told me all about it, so... <laughs> <laughs> Katrina, I hope you're watching because yeah, that was a super fun time. We they came down and visited me. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I graduated from high school in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, after going to high school in Maine and going to high school in Massachusetts, and two of my friends from my high school in Maine came down and visited me for my high school graduation in Puerto Rico, and we had the best time so yeah it's hard not to have a good time in puerto rico actually it's a lot of fun especially yeah. if you're with your friends so and we're gonna do a retreat there someday even if we don't we don't know when we're gonna maybe we can ask um um our uh, futurologist when we're gonna be able to do a retreat in puerto rico maybe he has some insight on that Who knows? i would like to know because a lot of our plans have been put on hold because of everything that's happening and maybe maybe we'll have more insight on what we can and when we can expect things i i can't wait i want yeah. to get to this, but yeah, let's not even wait let's just tell our jokes and move on um and then by the way i i haven't told dr pearson this but i've decided he is officially our futurologist for last life ever, from <laughs> henceforth or <laughs> the funny thing is he can hear us right now and i can see him laughing even though no one else can um all right so all right so you go ahead you said you had a great joke about the future i want to hear it I don't know if it's a great joke I, don't oversell it please there's never been a great joke well listen that. listen for what it's worth i do think the future is going to be great i know this because i'm always looking forward to it <laughs> I like how you stuck your joke in there. Good for you, Jeff. That was the way to do that. All right. I know it had to be delivered just right. So yeah. yeah. My <laughs> actually, I have another joke I can tell. So if that one wasn't good enough, we'll throw another one in. Well, this one I'm about to tell is pretty darn awful. So all right, uh, fair enough. Well, I'm looking forward to this as well. Okay, so there's a guy he goes to a fortune teller, and the fortune teller's like, "Oh my gosh, I'm looking into your future, and I see on Friday." your wife is going to die. And he goes, I know that, but I need to know if I'm going to get arrested. Oh God. That's, um, um, that is not a joke about the future. That's a joke about really bad psychics and murder. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, uh, listen, I'm going to loan, I'm going to loan you my backup joke. All right. So the past, the present and the future walk into the bar. It was tense. Oh, you got it. <laughs> I knew you would have seen it because that's the first joke that comes up when you when you uh, Google um, bad jokes about the future. We got to get is, ourselves a resident joke writer. I'll work right. on that. Hey, listen, you know what I think? I think I'm just going to go ahead and bring our guest in. So Dr. Pearson is um, amazing, and we're going to let him talk for himself. But he is, like I said, one of the best um, people to talk to about the future because he has i think it's like an 85 percent success rate in predicting the future over a long period of time we'll let him talk to us about that so dr pearson thank you for being on last life ever it's a pleasure uh, thanks for inviting me on hi jeffrey and hi jillian nice to meet hi. you 
Nice to meet you. So can, you know, Jeff corrected me and told me you prefer futurologist. Tell us what a futurologist just does, what it means. A, a futurologist is exactly the same as a futurist. But, you know, we invented the language and we know how it works. Uh, you Americans are slowly catching up, but futurology is the study of the future. That's what I do. That's what most futurists do. Uh, futurists, it's, it's something to do with the art world, isn't it? Someone who paints in the futurism school or something. So uh, uh, <laughs> nothing to do with futurology. I don't know where that word comes so, from. So your problem with the term futurist is that Americans are dumb. That's what you're saying. <laughs> well, it's not entirely the reason for why I believe the Americans are like that, but it's... <laughs> uh, <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Well, for you, for those who don't know, Dr. Pearson is British, so he gets to tease us once in a while. And then we get to point out that we um, uh, won the war. Have, have, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Funny that one. <laughs> it's the one that counted, time. though, right? Wasn't that the one that mattered? After Brexit, we're going to colonize you guys again. <laughs> you know what? We probably need it. So. <laughs> Thank you. It's a bit vulnerable. It's a good time to invade. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so, so yeah. So, okay. So you're a futurologist and, you know, I've talked to you a few times in the past. So, but our guests don't probably don't know much about you because your reach is much broader in Europe than it is here in the United States. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you do now. Like what, 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 what's your day-to-day -day life like? Well, uh, what I really am underneath the skin is I'm an engineer. I've been an engineer all my working life. Uh, I've always worked on the front edge of engineering uh, for our future side of things, trying to design things that really we won't be using for 10, 15, 20 years. And when you're doing that, you have to think about what the future is going to be uh, at the time when you're going to be releasing it. So you're bringing out the right sort of a product. And I discovered way back in about 1990 that it was more fun doing that bit of it than it was doing the actual engineering bits. So I'm still an engineer. I still approach thinking about the future from a technology standpoint, engineering it. And then I sit and think about how are we going to use these new products, these new services uh, based on these future technologies and how will they change our lives once we start using them? So that's, that's what I do. I just sit and think all the time uh, about mainly new technologies and then how they'll affect our lives. So at the moment, uh, I'm getting excited again because of the, uh, the space race is, is picking up quite a lot. And I was, uh, uh, I was eight years old when the moon landing happened. Uh, so uh, uh, I remember, remember how excited I was sitting watching that. And I, I can't wait for it to all to start again. So it's it's getting up to fever pitch now. We got a, a launch on Wednesday, I believe. Some uh, NASA astronauts going up in Musk's rocket, which is something of a first. And uh, I can't wait. It's going to pick yeah. up again. Well, let's so, let's hope. Along, we're back on the moon with moon bases and uh, sending people up to Mars. And uh, I've been inventing, you know, things like uh, uh, new ways of getting into space and uh, uh, all sorts of weapon systems for what you can do from space to sort of wipe out other civilizations or whatever. It's all good fun, but it's uh, nothing that's ever got you to happen. <laughs> I think um, wiping out civilizations might not be good fun, but um, but so hopefully by the time this broadcast, the um, launch that you're talking about on Wednesday will have gone really well. I've read there's a weather issue, so they might not be launching Wednesday. They might be delaying till the weekend. But but I mean it's a big deal, right? Because for especially for the United States, we're talking about launching astronauts from U.S. soil for the first time in about a decade, uh, and then doing it for the first time ever in a, a private company's rocket. Um, which is really exciting. I um, I don't know if I ever talked about it on the show. Uh, when uh, Musk tested the uh, Falcon Heavy rocket um, and launched his Roadster into orbit around Mars, I actually went down to see that uh, live, and it was amazing. And I actually may be going um, this week down to Florida. It's about a seven-hour drive and, and watching this launch as well. Um, kind of watching the weather right now to see if that's going to work out for me or not, but. Yeah, it'll be very exciting to to watch a launch. It's a very long drive. That's a lot of commitment. 
Yeah, well, so my dad has a place down there, so I can drive down, stay at his condo. They've got a swimming pool and stuff. And Florida's opened back up enough that I can actually, you know, go to restaurants and stuff. So, right. um, so it's a it's a situation where I can get out of the house for the first time in weeks, right? And I can go hang out in the sun by a pool, and then I can go watch a rocket launch. So it seems like a nice, yeah, it's a commitment, but it's also a nice diversion from being stuck in my house, right? So sounds good. Yeah, you're welcome to, to fly over and join me, but I, I think it might be a little bit tricky for you to get that uh, get that done. Like uh, re re reading the articles on just how densely they're packing the airplanes at the moment, I don't think we, don't think that'd be much fun. And a uh, seven or eight hour flight with a face mask on doesn't really sound very appealing either. No, it really doesn't. <laughs> it's, driving in my car, I don't have to wear a face mask the whole no. time. You know, I mean, get out and get pump gas or whatever. But uh, yeah. yeah, you know, I, I bought some face masks just in case because eventually we're going to have to wear them. But uh, I tried one on and I nearly suffocated. You know, but a, a minute later I was uh, gasping for for air, so I took it off. And then I tried one of the uh, the other ones I bought, were these surgical ones. I, I, even after five minutes, you know, I couldn't cope with that anymore. I don't know how these doctors wear those things all day. Uh, I think five minutes is more than enough. To it. I think, and I think it's kind of just like the reality of the situation. But maybe you can tell us better than than we would know. But I think we're all going to have to get used to these face masks. I don't think this is going to leave us anytime soon. And I'm wondering what you think about that. Are we ever going to get back? <clears throat> to a sense of normal? Are we ever, like, are we gonna recover like they did in the 19, 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, um, where we're gonna be able to not wear masks and we're gonna be able to be in crowds and we're gonna be able to do that? You know, it, uh, there's two sides of it. One is the, the virus bit, and we will get back to normal in terms of you know, virus will decline. And we will eventually get on top of it and we'll get down to sufficiently low num numbers that we can track the people that have got it. and and basically wipe it out and it might recur you know once every winter or something like that maybe uh, we might get a few um, people affected but you know substantially the virus will go away the other side of it though is our reaction to it and you know this really in terms of the numbers of people being killed hasn't really been a lot much worse than most uh, 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 flu attacks in the past you know maybe we got 50 percent more or twice as many but it's not hugely more uh, than a flu virus in terms of the numbers of people being killed uh, apparently it's a worse experience for those people who have had it, but it's uh, uh, the reaction to it has been absolutely huge. You know, we've closed down our economies a uh, long, long time after we get back to normal in terms of the health uh, um, things. We'll, we'll still be dealing with massive queues for uh, hospitals and for um, you know, even for things like getting your hair cut or something. You can see it's not much of a problem for me, but it's uh, a lot of people can't wait to get to a hairdresser. So. Um, there'll be massive queues for the first uh, few months and then there'll be queues for other things for years and years to come. It's going to take years to clear the medical backlogs for all of the surgery that hasn't happened. Uh, a lot of people are going to die because they weren't able to get to hospital and haven't been diagnosed from cancer and strokes and heart disease and lots of other things. So there's a massive amount of uh, ongoing deaths to come that have got really nothing to do with the virus itself, but have got to do with our reaction to it. And the fact that our politicians sat and ignored it all until it was too late. You know, they sat and watched while all the horses bolted from the stable. And then they started to have meetings to discuss whether or not they should close the doors. You know, that is not a very clever reaction, uh, but that's what they did. And since then, they've been trying to save face by overreacting and closing everything down far too long. And as a result, our economies shot to pieces. We're going to have massive government debts to pay back. I um, mean, you know, tens of thousands of of dollars per capita are going to have to be repaid. And of course, politically, that can't happen in one session. So it's going to be spread over decades. And our kids and our grandkids are going to be paying back those debts. So, you know, what happens if another virus comes along in two or three years' time? Because there will be another virus. Will they make the same sort of overshoot again? Uh, if they do, then we could have our economy just going all the way down to uh, the zero very quickly. So. We've really got to get a handle on how to deal with these things. It's not really the virus itself, which is the uh, the biggest problem, but our reaction to it and the overkill. You know, there might be far worse viruses than this going to come along in the future. Uh, if we're going to behave like this every time any virus comes along, we really will be in trouble. What do we do then? So what do we do ahead of time? If, if the reaction wasn't the right reaction, what can, and we can't control the governments. I mean, we can control them with voting but that only goes 
so far. They're, the government's going to do what the government's going to do. So what can we do as human beings to, to, to live our best lives while the world seems to be falling apart? Well, I mean, the uh, lock lockdown is going to be eased fairly soon. I mean, certainly this side of the pond, we're getting some signs that we're going to be allowed to do some normal things soon. Um, I think uh, we should just, uh, as, as, as soon as those things do appear, we should just grasp them and get out there and get back to normal. Um, we should very much let our politicians know that we will not vote for these guys if they're going to do the same thing again. Uh, next time we hear of this, uh, a viral outbreak starting in some faraway country, uh, we want our politicians immediately to stop flights from that particular country. We don't want to wait until two million people have been affected and then uh, think about slowing the flights down. Um, and certainly there's no point in putting in quarantine after the fact, as far as we're doing in this country. Um, but, you know, we, we need to have a rapid reaction, kind of like uh, South Korea did or, um, you know, various other countries. And e even New Zealand, I mean, they didn't uh, do that quite quickly, but they did the... Uh, shutting down fairly fast after that and the very, very, very firm lockdown. And that went very well too. So, you know, proper prompt action by the politicians can solve the problem. And you don't have to have this massive overshoot if you let, uh, sit and wait and watch it become too big a problem to tolerate. And then you've got to do massive things to the economy. You've left it too late. And we shouldn't tolerate our politicians making those sort of mess. And we shouldn't vote those guys back in. So are you voting uh, uh, Boris out? Well, uh, the trouble we have, well, you've almost got the same problem is that uh, you can vote these terrible guys out and you've got some really awful guys that you can put in their place. You know, do you want <laughs> terrible, do you want really awful, or do you want absolutely awful? And that's usually the choice we've got. So it's, uh, uh, we, we, we need to solve politics. You know, we need some new parties. A bunch of us on Twitter today were discussing how we need to get, uh, uh, some uh, parties which aren't lunatic fringe lefties or lunatic fringe uh, rights. You know, we, we, we've got to have something in between and uh, we, we, we just don't. So we don't have much choice over here. Uh, so looking at your choice, you know, you seem to be very good at picking people that are, uh, you know, either completely complete uh, idiots or they're very corrupt or whatever. You know, there's, there's, you don't seem to get much choice outside of the pond either. <laughs> so is it, are you saying that we can expect your uh, MP campaign to start any minute? <laughs> you, you won't see me getting into that uh, uh, trough anytime soon. I don't think anybody would vote for me. Um, <laughs> you're like uh, kind of voting for Attila the Hun or something if you put me in charge. I think that Jeff <laughs> would vote for you for, for sure. I, I would, that. except for I'm not in the right jurisdiction for that. So. No, but um, okay. All right, so we don't want to spend the whole time talking no, about politics. We want to talk about the really fun stuff, because the thing about sure. you is you have some really great ideas, and some people would say some really crazy ideas about the future. But in spite of your um, sort of outrageousness of some of the things that you say, you have a really good track record. Um, in fact, I alluded to this earlier, so I want to ask you about that for our guest's sake. Um, you said that you have an 85% success record at predicting the future, right? So how did you calculate that and how do you know that that's true? Well, I used to produce uh, BT's technology timelines. BT is the English version of at and And I used to produce technology timelines back in 1993 was the first one and then 95 and 98 and 2005. And um, you know, it occurred to me around about 2005 that actually it was quite a long time since my first one. I really ought to be able to just go through and see what I got right and what I got wrong. So I just dug out my first couple of timelines and I just put a ticker across beside every single one according to whether it was correct or not. And then I just added up the ones that got right and divided it in, and it was 85%. And I did it for the next timeline, and it was 85.8%. Uh, so I thought, well, that's pretty close. You know, it's, uh, out of two timelines, I've got 85% uh, accuracy. Uh, the other side of that coin, of course, is that 15% of my predictions are complete rubbish. <laughs> hey, but, you know, that's better than a lot of those people out there making oh, yeah. predictions. Yeah, um, yeah. And of course, some of your predictions we don't know yet, right? Like, if you predict something that's going to happen 100 years from now, you can't really score that. Yeah, I, I, I have good fun with the far future. I mean, I get a lot of my clients ask me to do predictions for 100 years away. And I say, there's no point in going much beyond 2050, because by about 2050, we're starting to link our brains to the machines so well that effectively you're adding a few digits onto your IQ. You, you're 
uh, connecting your brain to directly into Google so that every time you think about something, the answer's there in your head. It's like you know all of human knowledge and you've got massive IQ to process it all. So how can you possibly predict uh, what people with that level of, of intelligence working with you know, a few million super smart AIs to help them, uh, what are they going to invent after 2050? We haven't got a clue. You know, so basically 2050, you're starting to get uh, superhuman capabilities and you can't predict what a superhuman is going to invent. You just can't. So this is... Um... I think a lot of people refer to that as the singularity, right? This this Somewhere, sort of yeah. horizon where where like uh, after the, which we really can't predict things, right? Because it's and and some people say it's you know the rise of the super smart machine that's so much smarter than us that causes it. And and, and I know you're um, concerned about that too to some degree. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, we can't predict what the super smart machine is going to do either, right? To get into like the Terminator style uh, problems or something like that. So, what do you yeah. think? What are the what are the likelihood that we're going to be waging war against robots in the future? It depends. Uh, the The key thing is that we have to be able to link the computers to your brain before you get super smart AI. If you get super smart AI and it's you know, far smarter than, than we are, then it's capable of producing weapons that we don't understand. It can produce encryption systems that we don't understand. It can do whatever it wants to hide. It might be our best friend. It might decide that all it really wants out of its existence is to make life better for humans, or it might not. It might decide it's got some really cool physics experiments it wants to do. And as a consequence, you know, it just happens to uh, obliterate all life on earth, but it's a small price to pay losing a few billion of these puny little humans. I don't really care about them very much. So even without being maligned, uh, an AI, which is smart enough, could be an existential threat to humans. It's not a good idea to choose something that smart without being able to link it to your brain so that you can keep up with it. If you can keep up, then it doesn't get super smart compared to you. You keep up with it, so it doesn't become that big threat. So to me, the only real solution that we have to the Terminator problem is uh, that you've got to develop the direct brain link before you develop the uh, terminator capable AIs. But doesn't that imply that the machines can be uh, emotional? It implies that the machines can be super smart. Uh, they don't need to be emotional. It could be just completely inconsequential to them that the white out all life on earth. Uh, you know, if they've got this interesting experiment, and it just happened to be playing with strange particles or something and they design an accelerator and they get it built by some of their pet robots and they just build this stuff. We don't even know what they're doing. You know, we think they're building a nice new hospital with a fancy scanner or something. Uh, but you know, they switch their experiment on and all life on earth gets wiped out. You know, it could be something like that. It doesn't have to be a Terminator style war of super smart machines versus people to be a big threat. But you know, the other side of that is that some people say, well, you, you should never talk about the Terminator scenario because there's no proof that the super smart machine would be uh, an enemy to mankind. Well, there isn't, but there's no proof it'll be our friend either. And that's a heck of a risk. Uh, you can't assume, and just like in watching Star Trek, some of the civilizations you meet are very nice, sweet Vulcans, but you meet the occasional Klingons uh, as well who just want to wipe you out because it's fun and they just want some glory. So you've got to be quite careful going down that road. And I, I do believe you could make super smart machines. I believe you can make them emotional. We already have a good ideas, a set of good ideas how you could make them emotional and conscious. So it could be super smart, they could be conscious, they could be emotional, uh, very different from us, kind of like very advanced alien civilizations is probably the best analogy we would have. But I, I don't believe the people that say that you can't ever make an AI smarter than humans. There's no evidence for that at all. I think you can. So the um, I've always the problem I've always had with the science fiction movies where we're fighting machines or alien cultures or whatever is that any um, machine that's super smart is going to be so much smarter than us. We're not actually going to fight them. It's kind of like saying you know ants are going to fight us, right? Like like ants don't fight us. Like if we want to kill an ant uh, hill, we just kill it, right? It just it's dead. It doesn't matter. Like we don't even think about it. And that's kind of what it would be like, right? We're not really going to be in a war where like human spirit is going to overcome like super smart machines because we're not even going to understand how they're attacking us. They're not going to shoot projectiles at us. They're going to design something that kills us instantly or you know yeah. just turn us off in some way yeah 
I think, I mean, if, if they are that much better than us in terms of intelligence, we really just do not count. You know, my wife was planting some flowers this afternoon. Uh, one of those is growing in a place where there used to be some ants living in the ground, which is, I just happened to notice there was an ant calling me there. She, did, she didn't ask their permission uh, to do the, to plant the flowers, she just plants them. Uh, you know, it's almost an inconsequential act for, for her to do that, but it's, uh, you know, the ant colony would probably prefer that she didn't. Uh, and, you know, we're in pretty much that same position if you go ahead 100 years if we don't make a direct brain link. So you got to be quite careful with it. So you think uh, Elon Musk's going to solve this for us? Because like he's talking about his Neuralink all the time, right? About yeah, he is. So uh, I mean, the Neuralink is is quite a primitive thing to do. I mean, it's just a little bit of neural lace, as he calls it, stuck on the brain surface, uh, picking up slightly better signals than you would get by having a few electrodes on the outside of your skull. That's fine as a next step. Uh, what we really need to do, and he knows this, of course, is you've got to get deep inside the brain. You've got to connect to every single synapse. And there's nothing in principle to stop you doing that. You know, we can already make transistors, which are just a few nanometers across uh, your nerve cells inside your brain, uh, neurons, you know, they're, they're, they're microns across, they're not nanometers across. So you can easily make uh, devices which are small enough in the future and disperse them into some sort of fluid or encapsulate them in tiny little capsules. And you could make that reasonably safe and you could stick them inside your brain and they can latch onto every single brain cell basically. and uh, copy all of the voltages going on at every single junction, every synapse, they can monitor the voltages and they can signal all of that to the outside world, to the IT. So you could make a clone of yourself. You could have Jeffrey or, or Gillian Mark II in a server farm in California, uh, running on some sort of silicon or carbon substrate, um, which is producing exactly the same mind, but maybe running a hundred times faster or a million times faster. You know, what does it look like if you got, you know, Gillian running at a million times faster uh, th th than she is today? You know, you would never get a joke in at all. <laughs> it's definitely true. It scares me, actually. Like, we, we have to make sure that we get there before she does. That's right. Oh, oh how dare you? <laughs> Listen, that's not even funny, first of all. And second of all, I'm only know. Tell me, my brother, can you lend me a... <laughs> For me to imagine that I could get it Tell me my done in a day, that is not my current reality. And it's not the current reality of a lot of our listeners. Our listeners are worried about things like, should I send my kids back to school? Should I travel? Should I get on a plane? What about, um, or, or should I invest in commercial real estate? Should I invest in gold? What, these are their problems right now. And so um, I'm kind of wondering what you think people should, what kind of actions people should be taking right now to improve their lives with the new future that will be here, you know, by 2050. That's not that long away. It's 30 years away. Um, so uh, there's going to be a lot of in-between time though. What, what should they be filling their time with? Yeah, the, the, the COVID situation certainly accelerated a number of changes. Tell me my brother. Quite a long time, but it's accelerated a great deal. And what we're seeing now is the beginnings of what I call the care economy. And if you imagine a world where the AIs and the robots are doing most of the intelligent work, they're doing the professional type jobs, and the robots are doing the physical, you know, the the ones that need high levels of dexterity are going to be done by the robots. So even somebody like a hospital consultant is basically an AI attached to a sophisticated robot, if you think of it that way. Um, on the other hand, the, nobody would accuse the average hospital consultant of having a good bedside manner. You know, a lot of these guys are thoroughly arrogant and the patient's just a nuisance, you know, wasting their time. Uh, the nurse, on the other hand, uh, you know, the nurses pride themselves on having the human compassion and the human interaction with the patient, which they know is actually important in the patient getting better. So we know that care uh, matters. We know that compassion and emotions matter. <clears throat> we know that there will be, uh, in, in, a, in a world which is highly automated with a lot of the work being done by AI, there'll be a strong premium on having a human presence, on having an interaction with another human being. You will value that in ways that you, will, you won't value something which is just produced by the machines. So I call that the care economy. And you see examples of that already in today's world. You know, I've got some uh, glasses in the kitchen that, you know, drink water out of, you know, things like this. 
And you know, the, 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 these glasses, they cost less than a dollar a piece, but they're uh, high, high precision manufacturing. All of them are exactly the same. I've also got a, a, a cupboard where my uh, glasses that I would drink whiskey out of are made. Uh, and, and, you know, they're made of cut glass, you know, those sort of lead crystal uh, glasses. And they're, you know, they're, they're $50 a piece. Uh, they're not high precision. These are made by humans and they carve the glass using intricate techniques that it takes them decades to learn how to do. And if I was to spend decades doing it, I would never have the skill that these guys have. And I'm quite happy to pay $50 a glass to buy those things because they exemplify the, the best that humans can possibly cope with. It's still a shoddy workmanship if you compare how many microns precision they have compared to the ones that you buy for a dollar, but they have the human um, embedded in them. They've got the human skills. They've got the emotional skills, the training that that person went through to be able to do that. And I value that. And that's the sort of example of you know, the care economy other than obviously carrying jobs and emotional jobs into personal jobs. So I would say that, you know, what we really all need to get used to is living in a care economy where emotions are much more important and the actual knowledge in your head and your ability to process it is less important because you can delegate that bit to a machine. So wow. that first and foremost is part of the future. That's really, I mean, that's yeah. amazing that you're saying that. And I'm listening very intently because I mean, so much of everyone's business in this world now is going towards AI and trying to get things taken care of by machines and, and technology. And if you go to a chat box on, you know, Bank of America's website, for example, you're talking to a robot at first until they decide they're going to connect you with an actual human being. So um, Etsy's going to have a future, it sounds like. People who are making yeah. things on Etsy are going to, to clean up in the care economy because people are going to be willing to pay a premium for certain. For yeah, certain. you'll still go to Amazon and the likes for your uh, everyday stuff. You probably buy most of your stuff from Amazon. Uh, but when you really care about something, when you're buying a birthday present for your best friend or your mom or something, that's when you would go to Etsy because that's got the human stuff in there. It's got the, uh, the human skills, the craftsmanship. Uh, you care about that. It's got some emotion in it. And that's what you're trying to give to the other person as a present. So, you know, you don't buy that off Amazon, you buy it off Etsy. And we're already heading that way very quickly. And a lot of other jobs are going the same way. When you walk into a bank, uh, it's probably because you want to deal with a human being. If you don't want to deal with the human being, you just use the cash point outside. Uh, and, you know, when the cash points first came in, uh, actually, there were queues of people queuing at the cash point to avoid having to contact with the, the cashier inside. So it's, it, it isn't always as black as, and white as it's being human, it's therefore better. Uh, sometimes you just want to get the transaction done. If that's all you want, you just go to the machine. You just get it delivered by Amazon in the cargo box. If you want the human contact, if you want advice, if you want someone who's sympathetic and understands that you're in debt and you can't afford to pay back all of that loan, right away so you want some advice and some sympathetic smiles as you negotiate you know how you could pay this off over a longer period then you want to talk to a human being so it's, it's pretty obvious just using common sense which bits will be which but we can call that the care economy and more people will be working in those areas where it's the human skills and the emotional skills which count and so if you've got kids you know thinking about going through school and university which subjects should they be doing Really, the stuff which they really need to know is what they're learning on the school playground, where they're learning to interact with the other kids. Uh, you know, at least once they're allowed close to the other kids again. Uh, it's actually not what they're learning in the classroom that matters the most. Uh, anybody can get that off Google or ask your AI to do it. But the skills you're learning in the playground, uh, in between the classes, the interpersonal skills, the sympathy, the leadership, the motivation of these other friends that you're making, uh, those are the really good skills that you need to cultivate. Um, there's, there's a lot of uh, everyday common sense going back uh, millennia that we all have. We all know we need those skills. And even another way of looking at it is that, that when, you, when you join a big company and you think you're, you're hoping one day to get up to chief executive or something, when you first join straight out of university, you uh, get all of the, uh, the mundane jobs which require you to have a huge amount of knowledge and and skill at using equations or whatever it is. Uh, you need to know all of that knowledge. It's all fresh. You just spent three or four or five years learning all of that stuff. It's really important. As you move up through management, that becomes less and less and less important. The skills which start to dominate 
or knowing that you can take somebody to a round of uh, golf or take them to a ball game and you can talk to them and motivate them, persuade them that they should feel comfortable doing business with your business and you win those deals. And for that, you then get an executive role, uh, you move further up onto the board and then eventually become CEO. And the CEO usually has got very, very low technical skills. Quite often they know nothing about the company that they're in, in terms of how to do stuff. What they know is how to motivate other human beings, how to manipulate them, how to get them to sign on the dotted line and to give them the big contract rather than this other big company. Those are the skills that get you to the board level. So it's the human emotional skills, which already count, but that's just going to get more and more important. So that means there might be a future for uh, last life ever then, huh, Jillian? Oh, because we're so personable and friendly and sweet and lovely? <laughs> well, I was thinking because, you know, it's going to be really hard to find an AI that's as crazy dumb as we are, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So so what I'm hearing is, is that people are going to have to get back to school. They're going to have to get back to to being around people and and we're wanting we're going to want to do that sooner rather than later so that you know those those human relation skills don't fall to the wayside um which brings me you brought up you know skills on the playground um what should parents be thinking of what should the co you know i'm more concerned about the college students right college college campuses are like uh, probably worse than kindergarten classrooms in terms of you know, disease spreading and, and things of that nature. So what should kids who are going into college worry about? What should they be looking forward to? And what should any kid who's going back to school think about? I mean, the things that people need to study at, at, at college are still, at the moment, you still need to have the thinking skills, whatever it is you're going into, good analytical skills, good uh, uh, interpersonal skills, you're gonna learn those at college anyway. Uh, it really worries me that people are talking about making this, making the lessons online. It isn't just the content of the lessons that matters. It's learning with other people and learning how to work with those other people. The uh, spending time in the bar in the evenings at university and going to the parties. That is all part of the important stuff you learn at university. Um, and people should learn that. You know, that, that really is important. Um, but they... Uh, at the moment, at least for the next five or 10 years, you will still need to have those analytical skills. You will still need to learn that basic knowledge. So still go and get your degree, um, go and get it in whatever subject you can, uh, get the best analytical skills and the best basic knowledge, get you through the next five, 10 years. But after that, that probably won't count for diddly squat when it comes to actual economic value because uh, your uh, $20 PC will probably know more than that will. <laughs> uh, so it's uh, okay. But, you know, there's another area. One of the questions you asked uh, Gillian earlier was uh, about what you should you invest in in terms of real estate. And Jeffrey and I discussed this a little while ago. Um, I still remember the answer to that is that uh, you should avoid investing in urban areas because one of the big hangovers that this virus is leaving behind is that a lot of people will not want to work in offices anymore, and that is not going to change. A lot of those people will not go back to those offices. So the rentals that you can get from owning those buildings is going to go down. So the real estate value in the cities is going to plummet. And as people discover that they can work from anywhere, the people on good salaries are going to want to buy houses in the very nicest, prettiest places. So if you can, if you got money to invest, find the prettiest place that you can afford to buy any property in and put it there. Because pretty is always going to be in fashion. People are always going to want to live somewhere really nice. Uh, whereas nobody's going to want to live in an ugly city, uh, you know, from now on. So uh, don't don't buy anything in an urban area. Buy it in the countryside, but buy it in the prettiest countryside you can afford. <laughs> all right. Awesome. So, all right. So here's what I want to do because we're gonna we're gonna be out of time soon. So I'm gonna ask you a couple of uh, <clears throat> questions because I think it's very interesting to hear. What, I'm interested to hear what you're gonna say. So this is the series. What is life gonna be like? You just said that. Um, that for the next five or 10 years, um, we're gonna need to be analytical, which implies that in five or 10 years, we're not gonna need to be analytical anymore, right? So if someone's in high school right now, uh, maybe they're just starting high school, 
you know, they might be 10 years before they're out of the university or college. And uh, so then, so let's, let's, I, so I guess what I'm trying to say is what's life going to be like 10 years from now? What's the average day in Dr. Pearson's life 10 years from now, like, or my life or Jillian's life or one of our listeners life. And then the same question again, 20 years from now, I kind of want to feel like, what, what do you think is going to change 10 in the next 10 years? And then in the next 20 years, I think in the next 10 years, we're going to see quite a lot of erosion of the professions. You know, so we saw a lot of administrative jobs being essentially automated during the last 10 years. In the next 10 years, you're going to see a lot of professional uh, jobs being automated. Um, things like uh, even things like being a lawyer at the lower levels, uh, uh, a lot of that can be automated. So be able to ask your PC in 10 years time. Uh, the answer to a legal question and it'll probably be able to tell you so if you want to know you know what is the law in uh, such and such a state about me setting up a company how is that different from the law here it'll be able to understand what you're asking and tell you what the key differences are it'll be able to offer to do it for you to set up your new company uh, that kind of stuff you don't need uh, a basic lawyer uh, to do that for you so you would be able to get that kind of job automated and exactly the same sort of thing in any other profession whether it's accountancy or uh, in real estate, whatever, uh, if, it's a, if it's a fairly straightforward professional role, you'd be able to automate it. But, you know, the guys working in those industries uh, will move up the ladder. You know, as they've been in there a few years, they will get the human skills. Uh, there's still, as, as you well know, there's a, a lot of skill in real estate. That, you know, it's not just about analysing the value of a property or being able to uh, calculate, you know, how much would it cost to make some modifications to increase its value or something. You know, you need to be able to do that kind of stuff. But the real value is is understanding the customer. You know, where are they coming from? Making that emotional bond, uh, smiling sweetly, and making them sign on the dotted line to buy it at the highest premium, so you get your biggest cut. And you know, that is a human skill. So you know, again, you're moving up the ladder away from the processing skills towards the human skills, and that's what we're going to see even in the next ten years in the professions. If you go ahead 20 years, I would say that uh, we're getting to the point where the computers are able to take on board quite a lot of the emotional tasks as well. So we're starting to see some serious competition, even in jobs where having a nice personality is important. You know, jobs like you two do with your show, uh, you might have AIs with interesting looking uh, avatars with very sweet personalities are exactly the right degree of prickliness to get on with each other and wind each other up and stuff. You know, there's nothing to stop you in principle from doing that with very advanced AIs in the 20 year time frame. I'd be very surprised if you got that in the 10 year time frame. You know, s s simple analytical skills and stuff, yeah. Uh, replicating emotional values in a personality, probably not. You know, but 2040, yeah, you probably will be starting to get some of that stuff. And that really makes me worried about the, the care economy uh, once you get to 2050 and beyond, because, you know, I'm absolutely convinced we are, you know, the care economy is a thing, but it's not a thing forever. And right. uh, when you do get AIs, which are uh, as smart and as, as pleasant to be with as, as human beings, then we really do have some serious competition. But maybe at that point, we can just sit on the beach and watch them make all the money for us. And maybe we don't <laughs> need to worry too much. That'd be uh, nice. Or maybe we just, uh, you know, there's enough money to go around. You pay AIs and you pay some people. So maybe it, it's just variety. Is it safe to say that your favorite book is uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I've ever... I even glanced at that one, but it's uh, it sounds like a good book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, I think his favorite book has got to be one of his own books. I mean, that seems fair, right? Like, like he he probably goes back and rereads his um, Adventures of the Carbon Kid or whatever he calls it, because uh, that was a great book, by the way. He wrote a science fiction book that I really enjoyed. So oh, it's, it's called Space Anchor. Ah, uh, Space uh, Anchor. Yeah, that's yeah. right. No, I, I think my. If I had to pick one book from the whole of uh, history, it would, it would still be The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I think the, the, the general balance of insight and humor in that uh, series is brilliant. And uh, I almost met Douglas Adams once. We were supposed to be both at the same uh, book launch. Uh, some uh, Sherry Turtle, I think, from MIT was launching a book and uh, he, he was supposed to be the other panelist, but he was ill that day, so he couldn't make it. So I almost met Douglas Adams, but didn't quite. 
and it wasn't oh. very long after that when he died. But uh, I thought, nearly. So, quick random side note Ooh. about Doug Douglas Adams. One of the things, so so our viewers know this, and, and maybe you did too, Dr. Pearson, but I recently climbed Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. Um, and Douglas Adams, actually, for a charity, uh, to save save the wildlife charity, climbed Kilimanjaro wearing a rhino costume. So, <laughs> so, um, and, and so my friend, like my one friend who really likes um, hitchhikers, he's always telling me, he's always saying, well, yeah, whatever, you climbed Kilimanjaro, that's no big deal. Doug Adams did it in a, you know, he did it in a rhino costume. Um, but uh, yeah, so I don't know, that that's impressive to me because that was a really brutal climb and I don't think I could have done it with, um, anything more than what I was wearing. I don't think I could do it at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, one last question I want to ask you because we've been trying to get like this list from our guests. So now we have your book, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. We're going to definitely put that on our reading list. But where would you, well, and I know we're in a different environment now, but if you could travel anywhere, where would you travel? And don't say the moon or Mars because we cannot quite get there yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, so... There's, there's a whole world of places I would love to go. I, mean, I, I would say the Grand Canyon is probably one of them. Uh, y y Yosemite uh, and probably Thailand as well. I would love to go over there. Um, I, it's, uh, I, I know I would get ill on, on the first day and spend the rest of the holiday in <laughs> hospital, but I would quite like to see it. Um, I'm not very good at uh, having to work with uh, very different um, uh, cuisines. I get ill really quickly. Uh, I, I like my ordinary everyday food and anything which is markedly different. I immediately start uh, feeling ill. So uh, I'm not the best traveler. But you know, those, uh, there are several places on my bucket list, the same as everybody else, and probably the same ones as everybody else, too. Well, if you get to Yosemite, you're going to have to look Jillian up because she's not all that far from there. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm in Southern California. So we'll, well, we'll have to plan a, a little trip. That Well, thank you so much. That's awesome. Jeff, you must have one final question. I, I do. All right. So what technology is going to have the biggest impact on people's day-to-day -day lives in the next 10 years? Oh, it's a tricky one. Um, I would say drones. I mean, there's an awful lot to pick from when I mean, you get robots and AI and everything else. I would say drones, you know, we're starting to see them really picking up. They're discovering all sorts of new roles. And I think as, as a result of the extra push towards automation and AI, that's accelerating the drone markets too. So I would say drones are gonna be affecting us, even in trivial ways. Imagine today you, you might use a, a drone to follow you down a ski slope so that it takes videos of you or something if you're wealthy enough to do that. Um, by 2030, you probably have a small flock of drones flying around you all day. Um, just, you know, things just an inch across, maybe, with tiny little cameras, um, taking selfies of you from every which angle so they can stream them all onto TikTok or whatever it is you're using then. And, uh, you know, that sort of trivial thing at one end, uh, right up to delivering your parcels and stuff to avoid contact with people who might be infected with whatever disease it is in 2030. So, you know, drones, drones and more drones. Wow. Well, and the, so, so, all right. So that means that my Instagram drones are going to have to, um, I'm going to have to get on that right now and hire them because it would be a lot easier posting on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, whatever social media you're using. If someone who is just constantly photographing you, right, you, you, you'd yeah. be able to pick the best pictures, you'd probably get an AI to decide which one makes you look the, the most flattering picture of you and best filters. And it just happens automatically, right? That's what you're saying. Well, yeah. I mean, even in things like dating, you, know, you sort of see a, uh, somebody you fancy at the end of a bar, you just extend to your drone, and the drone goes over and chats up her drone, and before you know it, you've got a date arranged. Uh, so you can cut through the ice using this technology too. So it doesn't matter what you're talking about, you could find a role for a drone in there somewhere. Uh, it's cleaning, delivery, um, house assessment, you know, whatever it, whatever it happens to be, you can do it using a drone. So. There's an almost infinite market in, in that space. Uh, that's bound to pick up. The other things like AI and robotics, you know, they're important too. Uh, obviously, biotech's a big one at the moment. Uh, real estate's going to change dramatically in the next 10 years. A lot of things will change, but, uh, you know, 10 years isn't far enough away that you're going to get your direct brain links or living on another planet or anything. So you've got to stick with something we already have. And of those things, 3D printers are irrelevant. VR is going to collapse. Uh, 
the only ones you're left with is AI robots and drones. Whoa, 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 hold on. So 3D yeah. printers are irrelevant and VR is going to collapse. Yeah, 3D printing is the big technology that could have had a big impact, but it isn't really. Um, you're not going to have one of these in your kitchen printing your pizzas in 10 years' time. Uh, you might have one if you want to do your fancy icing for a wedding cake or something, um, but you're not going to have one for much other purposes. Uh, so 3D printing, uh, it's, it's, it's too messy, it's too expensive, it requires too much setting up, people just can't be fast with that sort of thing, so that's a non-starter. Uh, VR is going the way of 3D TV, it's a great idea, we all know we're going to use it one day, but it's just not ready. It keeps getting launched, it keeps failing, it's going to fail this time too. It'll come back in 10 years, maybe next time, maybe the time after that. We all know we want VR, but uh, we don't want to have to stick this whopping great headset on and uh, be totally isolated from the rest of the, the world. We wanted to incorporate uh, you know, real experiences and things too. So it's got to be a, a, a smooth blend between augmented reality and virtual reality in real life. And you've got to be able to blend between of those things really easily. And you can't do that with any other headsets. Wow, that's fascinating. And All right. That's so, the other one. You're going to be able to link to your nervous system by connecting to the chips on your nervous that, system. That scares uh, me. Uh, no, stop talking like that. <laughs> so, so, when, so, so what is? All right. So we do have to wrap up here, and I, I appreciate your time. But what uh, what technology are you most excited about? Like at any at any time horizon. Yeah, it's it's space technology for me. I can't wait till we send people off to Mars. Um, I I I just. Uh, I was so excited the first time we started going to the moon and I, I was upset when all that stopped, but it's uh, space technology still excites me a lot and I can't wait till we start doing really big stuff out there. Um, yeah. and, uh, so it'll get better think, and better and better. So so we're we're on the cusp of this new launch, yeah. right, that we talked about at the beginning. So when when are we sending people to Mars? Do you have any idea? Do you have any way to evaluate that? Not really. I mean, we see claims that we'll be doing it in the next 10 years. We might, we might not. Um, you know, 10 years isn't very long. I mean, if you look at how long it takes to do these trials and you've got to wait for the next good weather and you've got to do all these tests, mm -hmm. 10 years very quickly goes in. Uh, I'd be surprised if we got people on Mars in 10 years' time. But in 20 years, yeah, I think we'll have people there by, by then. Uh, and it won't be very long after we've gone to Mars before we've got big colonies in space, because it, at the same time, we'll be making moon bases and big space stations, you know, proper sized space stations. And there are lots of technologies being developed, which will give you much, much cheaper uh, voyage from the surface into space. So at the moment, it costs a lot of money to get a kilogram of anything into space. The costs of that are still plummeting, um, thanks to current technologies developing so quickly. And uh, that will get cheaper and cheaper. And eventually, we'll be able to get all of the hundreds or thousands of tons of stuff up into space that we need. To, to mine the asteroids, to get the materials, to build the enormous space stations, to do the next wave of colonization. But you know, Star Trek, here we come. Yeah. All right. So, how long for till the space elevator then? Oh, uh, fifty years. Fifty. Yeah. So I got a chance. If I live a good long life, I might be able to see that. You, you might see the space elevator. Um, the materials are already starting to exist. We're, see, we're seeing them in small quantities and small lengths, but. Uh, uh, at the moment, we still don't have the long length that you're going to need. You need 40,000 miles uh, or more to get uh, just up to the geostation and then some more after that for your candle weights. Um, so you need a long distance of, of, of rope and it gets meters thick at the, uh, at, the, at the middle of that. So this is no mean engineering achievement. It's really difficult to do. But before you get to that point, we get other exciting technologies like my uh, Pythagoras sling, where you can get something into orbit just by using two parachutes and a piece of string. You know, things like that will allow us to get stuff into orbit for next to nothing. And uh, we might not even need the space elevator if we can do that. Fair enough. Uh, Jeff, you were supposed to have one last question. I know, and I have like 20 yeah. more. I can, uh, I, I can have like 20 more, but I, I have know, one, one last question. Um, and this is actually, this is something I really, I'm really curious about. And that is, um, should we all just be investing in space technology then, since everything's accelerating right now? Should I just shift my uh, investment strategy right to, you know, buying Richard Branson's company or something? <laughs> Uh, I don't think so. I think uh, there'd be a lot of money to be made in space, but it's also going to be very popular to invest in that, that area too. 
I think you could actually make a great deal of money by using your skills in real estate and areas like that, because there are going to be a lot of people uh, losing a great deal of money. And that means it's a good opportunity for somebody else to, to earn it. And if you know which bits are going to go up and which bits are going to go down, as you do, you can make a lot of money in those areas. And then once you've got your super rich uh, bank account, you can then invest in space and do your own thing in competition with Elon Musk and uh, Bezos and so on. Okay, so your suggestion is I should just buy a bunch of pretty places and hope it works out. Uh, yeah, you, you know which ones to buy. I'll take yeah. your advice on that. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, listen, I really appreciate it. Jillian, did you have anything else? Oh, no, this was amazing. This was... This we barely crazy. scratched the surface. We might have to a whole series of shows where we just interview. If we can do Hunter it. Over so, and yeah, over Dr. Again. If you would come back, we would be very much appreciate it. Maybe we'll bring you back in like six months or so and we'll see, sure. see where we're at. Because this was, yeah, we went way over time, but this was amazing and was worth every last second. And I, I want to thank you for staying with us so long. We told you 45 mm -hmm. minutes, we kept you an hour or so. Thank you. Well, it's been a great pleasure for me too. I always enjoy talking to some nice people. So it's good fun. And I'll let All you know right, when well, you again. Thank you very much. We will uh, have to let you go now, but guys, make sure one, you tune in next week. One second, one second, one second. Okay. Where, Ian Pearson, where can people find you? Good point. Yeah. <laughs> My, my blog, I stick all my ideas on my blog. It's timeguide.wordpress.com. Oh, it's time great, by the way. Go there, subscribe, and then you get emails every time he posts something, which is what I finally got around to doing. And now I read every article that he comes out with. But um, it, yeah, there's just, there's so much we could talk about. His articles, you want to read about space elevators and the the sling that he just re re you know referenced. There, there's all this crazy stuff. I mean, actually, I think Dr. Pearson may have even invented text messaging. I'm not really sure. Um, that, that's, yeah, he literally invented text messaging. Um, we should have talked about that a while ago before everyone tuned out because they got past their 45 minute window. But <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. We really thank appreciate you. it. Um, follow Dr. Pearson on Twitter as well, at Time Guide. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys next week. Everybody.